Hello and welcome to another edition of Bread Theory. I am Zach, your chill companion through the world of leftist literature. And uh, before we get into the show tonight, uh, just a, a word about uh, how the stream went last time. I'm actually recording this after the fact because I tried a new experiment uh, with streaming. I actually had a, a guest on to discuss the conquest of bread with me. Um, and I hadn't done anything like that before, and it turns out my computer couldn't quite keep up with it. So it uh, crashed a number of times. There's, there's a bunch of stuff that got lost, especially at the beginning. My entire intro got cut out, which is why I'm re-recording it here, uh, as well as the, the last about half hour. Other than that, uh, the audio stayed pretty good, but the frames per second dropped to like one or two. So we look pretty much still throughout most of the, the, the stream, unfortunately. But you know, it was, it was a learning experience. It was, it was something I definitely wanted to try. Definitely gonna have more guests on. We're just gonna do it in a different way. Um, tested out a few options since then, and, and I think we can manage to uh, have it where we have a guest on without it totally crashing everything. So uh, look forward to that. Uh, look forward to that coming up. Um, and so just to, to redo the intro one more time, uh, my, my guest for this stream that you're about to listen to was Josh Finn of the In Defense of Liberation podcast, as well as the blog of the same name. So uh, I, I believe at the end uh, when I was showing his blog, that part got cut out too. So let's just take a look at it once again. This is his podcast. Uh, first of all, in defense of liberation, he talks about a variety of subjects, kind of what's ever on his mind, but it always has to do with uh, some sort of leftist theory, usually from, he describes himself as a revolutionary communist, so it comes from that perspective. So there you have his uh, podcast, and now I'll switch it over to his website, which includes his blog, In Defense of Liberation. Oh, I'm going to recenter that so you can see that a little better. In Defense of Liberation, also the name of the blog. So if you just go to uh, forliberation.wixsite.com, you can check out all that he is talking about there. And if you search your favorite podcast app for In Defense of Liberation, you should be able to find his stuff. Okay, with that out of the way, let's get to the main show. Thanks so much for bearing with us, and uh, I hope you get something out of this collaboration. It was a lot of fun. And it's something that we'll, we'll do again. I'll have Josh on the show again because it was such a good time. So thank you very much and enjoy the show. Sure. So I uh, go by he, him. Um, uh, like you said, my name is Josh. Uh, I, my biography. I, um, well, I always like to preface everything by saying I grew up really um, white and privileged. Um, I grew up in central New York in like a moderately well-off town, um, Rome, New York. Um, and my folks were kind of like, you know, middle of the line. Um, my dad worked at a machine shop. My mom ran a daycare. We, you know, were covered. So most of my life politics and all those things were the farthest thing from my mind. Um, sure. You know, fortunately, I uh, was able to live a, a, a pretty, you know, well off uh, life for most of my childhood and up through to my, you know, early adulthood. But for a lot of kids my age, and I, I, you know, I say that because I was a part of the folks who got kind of radicalized by this moment, but like 2016 uh, and Bernie Sanders yeah. uh, and kind of that, you know, moment era post Ferguson, um, that whole thing kind of brought me into politics because for the first time politics were being discussed on like social media like I was on Facebook a lot so like politics were being discussed not in a way that like felt disclusionary but like mm -hmm. it was like being had in conversation with like people that I knew which sure. was new to me because like nobody ever talked politics in my family so it you know it became something I cared about because even though we were well off, um, my grandparents owned their own business. And when they retired, they got like super fucked by Social Security. Oh, seriously. So 
like they're only barely able to afford their medication on Social Security <sighs> right now. So like as it stands, that was also a part of my radicalizing moment. So when I moved in with my grandparents, it was 2017. Sure. And of course, as we know, Medicare for all has since 2016 been a huge talking point, especially for Bernie. Mm -hmm. So I started talking about those things with my grandma. and She didn't really have, want to have those conversations. Um, so I tried having conversations with friends, but. You know, nobody really cared about that shit. You know, we were 17, 18, just about to graduate high school. Um, nobody was really thinking about that stuff in my area, it seemed, or at least in the circles I was running around with. So I kind of was looking for an outlet to get some of these new questions that I was beginning to have and uh, get some answers and get some information about, like, you know, why do we need Medicare for all? You know, what? why is our Medicare, medical, you know, care system so awful? Um, and so I started the Annoying Question Boy blog, uh, promptly named as such because that's what I was doing. I was asking <laughs> annoying questions. Ah, that's the origin uh, story. Yeah. And so I... Uh, <laughs> I didn't really have anyone to talk to in my personal life, so I was kind of just throwing these things out into space. But eventually I realized that, like, I could spend a decent amount of time not using these blogs necessarily just to ask questions, but to also put out the answers I learned to talk about those things, you know, because it was just a blog. At that point when I started, I wrote it like I was texting someone. So it was essentially like me getting my thoughts onto a piece of paper, but instead that piece of paper was a blog that people could read. Um, so I kind of started working through a lot of the questions I had and, you know, presenting some of the answers I was getting. And unfortunately, because I did it in the way that I did, all of my wrong answers and all of my mistakes are extremely public. Um, but I think it's better that way because it's pushed me to be more scientific in my analysis, more understood in, you know, the things I'm talking about rather than just blurting out my opinion on things. Because I think, you know, coming from Facebook, going to a blog, and then now what in defense of liberation has become is kind of that new, you know, chapter of realizing that if I'm going to talk about these things, if I'm going to advocate for change, if I'm going to call people out and say we need to be better, well, if I'm going to do that, people got to know why. They got to know how. And also, I can use this as a means when people say, well, what are you doing? Well, here's me trying to do, you know. Not everybody is able to get in the streets and, and organize, especially since COVID. And so In Defense of Liberation is my best uh, effort at trying to really advocate for liberation of not just, you know, because when we hear that word, we usually hear it in certain connotations. But I mean that in, in the purest sense like people's liberation communism sure yeah so would you describe your uh i guess centering political political ideology as communist uh i would call myself a revolutionary communist um that's okay. a new term that i'm trying to force myself to adopt because i think it sounds cool that's cool that's cool. uh how did you come to, to revolutionary communist to distinguish yourself from any other type or any other leftist ideology, for that matter. What 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 drives you to communism as opposed to anarchy or socialism or, or any of the other leftist flavors? So my politicization kind of came, like I said, from a more like observer sure. point of view. So because of that, I was lacking a lot of understanding, right? A lot of nuance, a lot of experience in these topics that I didn't personally have. And so I had to learn that. And through my, you know, best efforts at that, I have found that that Marxism oftentimes mm -hmm. and the theory that falls under that name is able to give the answers that I'm looking for in Very the cool. way that I can receive them. Because I think we all learn differently and I think we all uh, are able to understand things differently. And so because of that, the Marxist theory that I've read has given me the answers uh, that I can understand in the way that I can understand them. Hmm. And it's also provided a lot of new questions for me, and therein new answers that has really cool. opened my mind and my eyes to uh, a whole new world. So I, I call myself a communist because mm -hmm. 
That's what I'm aiming for. Communism. I haven't. I think most folks usually, especially in my skin tone range, <laughs> uh, usually go for like uh, anarchism and folks. That's like the whole trope, right? Is like, sure. oh, anarchists are just a bunch of angry white kids. Yeah. But in my area, that's like most of the pol- po- political, you know what I mean? Kids is like kids who call themselves anarchists. So I didn't, I didn't go down that because I fucking hated those kids. They annoyed me in high school. So I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't go down uh, that route. But I would also like to say that I doubt that any of them are reminiscent of or you know truly uh, a picture of what anarchism is. Sure. I just made my way towards Marxism naturally, and so that's what I, I call myself a revolutionary communist specifically because uh, J. Malfawad Paul, someone who I really. Uh, uh, acknowledge as kind of being my guide to this point in a lot of ways in my my conception of things, especially in philosophy. Um, he uses that term, and I think it's succinct in a way that all these different like ideological terms aren't. I am pro revolution, and I'm pro revolution for communism. So therefore, I am a revolutionary Very communist. Very cool. Very cool. Well, uh, that's going to tie in pretty well to the, the chapter that we're going to be covering tonight. We are, of course, continuing on with The uh, Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin, one of the, the founders and, and largest thinkers within the anarcho-communist uh, realm of leftist thought. And tonight we're going to be uh, talking about redistribution um, and what it, what it means after a revolution to uh, have everyone basically have all their their needs provided for um, and, and how that plays out. Is it just robbing every rich person you see and throwing it out to the, the next uh, group of people you find? Uh, or is it a little bit deeper than that? So we're going to get into the, the audiobook pretty soon. And just like every week, uh, we'll be pausing to comment and uh, give our ideas about uh, how this applies to the modern day and uh, just our, our general thoughts on it to help you understand. So, uh, of course, uh, the, the new um, thing this week is that I will have a uh, partner in crime, so to speak, to, to help us suss this out and, and get that, uh, that revolutionary communist perspective. I, I consider myself uh, more of an anarcho-communist. I, I really have been influenced most by, by this book in particular and, and Peter Kropotkin's idea of uh, what revolution means how it's more than just the overthrow of government, but also uh, the, the ultimate aim is providing for everybody, is his concept of all for all. So without any further ado, let's dive right into that book. And we will get to it in just one second and start it right up. This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Chapter 4. Expropriation It is told of Rothschild that, seeing his fortune threatened by the revolution of 1848, he hit upon the following stratagem. I am quite willing to admit, said he, that my fortune has been accumulated at the expense of others, but if it were divided tomorrow among the millions of Europe, the share of each would only amount to five shillings. Very well, then. I undertake five shillings if he asked me for it. Having given due publicity to his did as usual to stroll quietly through the streets of Frankfurt. Three or four passerbys asked for their five shillings, which he dispersed with a sardonic smile. His stratagem succeeded, and the family of the millionaire is still in possession of his wealth. It is in much the same fashion that the shrewd heads among the middle classes reason when they say, Ah, expropriation. I know what that means. You take all the overcoats and lay them in a heap, and everyone is free to help himself and fight for the best. But such jests are irrelevant as well as flippant. What we want is not a redistribution of overcoats, although it must be said that even in such a case, the shivering folk would see advantage in it nor do we want to divide up the wealth of the Rothschilds. What we do want is so to arrange things that every human being born into the world 
shall be ensured the opportunity in the first instance of learning some useful occupation, and of becoming skilled in it. Next, that he shall be free to work at his trade without asking leave of master or owner, and without handing over to landlord or capitalist the lion's share of what he produces. As to the wealth held by the Rothschild, I'm just going to stop it just for one second here. So to me, this talks about uh, more than just taking from the rich and giving to the poor. It goes beyond that very basic redistribution principle. In fact, he's talking about how he doesn't really care whether or not the rich people retain their wealth because uh, what's more important is that everyone gets all the necessities of life. You know, that's food, that's shelter, that's clothing. That's uh, the ability to get an education, the ability to get meaningful work, work that uh, they might otherwise not even ever consider, where they're just struggling and, and, and basically uh, just surviving to get by. So uh, to me, that's a very important distinction between just taking from one and giving to another. It's, it's, it goes beyond that. What, what are your thoughts on this part here, Josh? I think that also that calls into question kind of where it is that this wealth is coming from, right? Mm -hmm. Because if we are just to, say, take all the overcoats, lay them out, and give them to the people, well, there are folks who can go to the store and buy another overcoat, right? Right. And so we have to understand that there's a relationship there that is present. Um, the, the rich versus the poor is not so much the money in their pocket, but their relationship to, as we call it, you know, the means of production. But more Very importantly, true. just the means of survival. If you yourself are not able to go buy a coat or go buy a meal or go buy a home, right? Yeah. But if somebody gives you one, that doesn't really change the, the relationship you exist in. You're still mm. dependent. You are still uh, subservient to that system. And so what we should want is less just simply a, a rationing out of, uh, you know, the goods in more a uh, equitable society, right? Absolutely, yeah. And that, that's really what I, I see in, in Kropotkin's grand vision is a much more empowering society where people have that platform where they can never have to worry about falling past a certain point. That's not to say that everyone's going to end up in the same place. You know, definitely, if you really want to be an NBA player, but you just don't have the skill... There's, there's no system that's just going to put any random person into the NBA. But at the same time, no matter what you do, no matter how many mistakes you make, whether they're your mistakes or, or someone else's, or, or you're just a victim of circumstance or society, there's, there's a platform that you can be safe in that will allow you to get back up and try something different, try a different path in life. Like what, what does it really profit us to have people basically fall off the map and, and be literally dependent on on handouts and, and the system and and uh, say in the case of homeless people uh, instead of having medical care to have to worry about or have to rely on emergency room visits because they can't be refused like it ends up costing society letting these people fall further so giving them a platform and and just some some bare basis to to stand up and and be an active member of whatever community they're in I feel is a much more empowering, a much more free society than basically what we in America live in right now. Well, that's that's certainly a low bar, but I agree <laughs> definitely. Um, I think most importantly here is also the idea that um, <clears throat> you know uh, this kind of idea that oh sure you know my wealth came off the backs of these folks, but let me just dole out five dollars. That kind of bleeds into um, a lot of, you know, present uh, propaganda about socialism, where it oh, it's just everybody gets the same thing, and like everybody gets, right. you know, it. That's not all the same, all bland, that's not all how gray. Life works in any way. You can no. line a hundred people from the same city in a row who are all born at the same time in the same hospital and it's going to be a hundred different people mm -hmm. so how why is it that we think that just because we have an economic system that says hey uh if people don't have a certain uh bare amount of income they shouldn't just die um <laughs> yeah. uh or go yeah. homeless you know uh that's not going to change that for sure for sure well let's continue on here a little more 
thoughts, it will serve us to organize our system of communal production. The laborer may till the ground without paying away half of what he produces. The day when the machines necessary to prepare the soil for rich harvests are at the free disposal of the cultivators. The day when the workers in the factories produces for the community and not the monopolist. That day will see the workers clothed and fed, and there will be no more Rothschilds or other exploiters. No one will then have to sell his working power for a wage that only represents a fraction of what he produces. So far so good, say our critics. But you will have Rothschilds coming in from outside. How are you to prevent a person from amassing millions in China and then settling amongst you? How are you going to prevent such a one from surrounding himself with lackeys and wage slaves, from exploiting them and enriching himself at their expense? You cannot bring about a revolution all over the world at the same time. Well then, are you going to establish custom houses on your frontiers to search all who enter your country and confiscate the money they bring with them? Anarchist policemen firing on travelers would be a fine spectacle. But at the root of this argument there is a great error. Those who propound it have never paused to inquire whence comes the fortune of the rich. A little thought would, however, suffice to show them that these fortunes have their beginning in the poverty of the poor. When there are no longer any destitute, there will no longer be any rich to exploit them. And I think this builds on kind of the point that you were just making is where does, where do the rich get their wealth from? I mean, there's the, there's the classic saying, you can throw as many dollar bills as you want at a machine, but it's not going to make it start. You know, you can throw as much money as you want at a factory or a farm field. It's not going to plow itself or, or start making goods for you. So the idea is by, by liberating the, the poor and their, their way of thinking by helping them to uh, self-empower, um, the, the power of the wealthy kind of goes away, you know? The, the only reason that the, that the wealthy have had any power in the first place is through uh, generations of war, by basically stealing it from whoever they've conquered or through other families or through uh, one way or another leveraging their position and then uh, getting into a lofty place where they don't have to uh, do any labor of their own. They can just uh, say, hey, you want a, you want a job at my new factory? Well, you know, this is the, the going price. You, you better take it or you're going to starve. Basically, the, the threat of starvation is the only way that the, the poor is, is cajoled into uh, keeping on enriching the rich. So without that system in place, the whole thing kind of falls apart. The idea that you're just going to have some rich person sweep in and and take back over what do you think about that i think that that is very true and i think that more so than this i think our, our a good you know investigation point would be to understand you know where it is that this wealth comes from mm. how it is this you know select few because you know it really is it's one oh, way yes. that we can describe capitalism or liberalism or really any of the, the forms of governance or, you know, that exist in the world today would be like the rule of the few over the many. Right. Um, you know, that's the whole 1% thing that most of us know. And yeah. I think that that's really reminiscent to understand where that 1% comes from. How is it they get their power? Where, where is it from society that their wealth and their their privilege comes from because it's only an understanding that that we can understand what to do to give that to the people because ultimately we have to understand that as it exists you know you can't elect into we know this to be true here in america especially you can't just elect someone into power that's going to try to you know as some critics might say just throw money at people right. quote unquote socialism we can't <laughs> even we can't even elect someone that's going to give us a proper health care system. Oh, yeah. um, and, and that's not even how those things work. And so the fact of the matter is, why is there so few people standing above and outside of society, yet somehow capable of ruling over that entire society? That's what we have to figure out. It's a great question. And, 
You know, it's what built up the uh, divine right of kings back in feudalism. They, they, they knew that behind their whatever family's fortune they came from, there was some great crime, some, some great taking from uh, people with less and, and an a hoarding and amassing of power. Well, they had to then justify it, kind of retcon it. Uh, and so they came up with ideas like the divine right of kings and, and natural orders to hierarchies and or the caste system or all these 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 apparatuses to uh, legitimize their power. But uh, I mean, the more that I've learned, the more that I've studied theory, the more that I've studied history, the more I've found that that's just nonsense. It, there's, there's bullshit. There, yeah, there's there's nothing backing it up when you when you dig deep enough. Uh, it just kind of dissolves into the dust. Um, and so if that's, if that's not the truth, if there's not these, these natural hierarchies to things, if people weren't destined to rule their lessers, or if it's not the great men of history, as, as you would see it depicted in, in something like Ayn Rand's work, where you have these captains of industry who are just geniuses and also really great at business and also completely moral and would never undercut any of their competition and on and on. And And that's the people that turn the wheels of history and make all the great developments. Well, I mean, that's really not true at all. You look at, at virtually any great, uh, accomplishment, whether it's a leap in technology, it's come off the backs of, of generations that have all led to one person say, aha. And then they stand on the, on the, the, the shoulders of, of, all the people that have contributed through the generations, through different times, different parts of the socioeconomic ladder to make this one new thing. And they say, well, this is mine and, and I made it and I'm a genius. It's, you know, I, I think a lot of someone say like Elon Musk, who always got all these, these genius ideas. Well, if you look at it, his family made their fortune on emeralds and gave him huge loans to, to I, th- I think it was, he started out with PayPal and then... Yep. And then leverage that into an even bigger fortune. So the idea that he's just this wonder kid who's who's come up with all these brilliant ideas, and and it's just the 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 you know our our uh, our system working as it's supposed to, the the cream rising to the top. That's that's really nonsense. You know, he has an entire engineering team working behind him to come up with his his you know, his uh, Tesla designs and his, his energy wall and, and all of his big ideas. It's not just him. That's just fiction when it comes down to it. Right. That's like seeing the tree for the woods, right? It's right. like seeing what's behind the, the curtain. Sure. Yeah, definitely. And, and you'll find this time and time again, um, you know, the, from from our most recent, our, our last president who, who started his his fabulous financial career with a small loan of $2 million from his father to um, the Steve Jobs and Bill Gates of the world. All these people, they all have someone who either took a really big chance on them and gave them tons of money or just came from a wealthy family and they had the ability to fail. But why shouldn't everyone have some sort of similar ability to try their own ideas out. I mean, who knows what's been lost just by lack of having the right, being in the right place in the right time and having the right opportunity, being struggling with poverty for your entire life, never having the chance to have your greatness brought to the world. I mean, I think it leaves all of us uh, poorer in every sense of the word, you know, intellectually, uh, morally, uh, um, materially poor to, to keep so the masses of the, the just statistically, keeping the, the masses of the people to the point where they'll never have the chance to have their Elon Musk moment, uh, their big breakthrough, it makes us all poor. And and so this is this is one big reason where I'm in favor of more horizontal systems where, where power and opportunity is spread out as far as possible, just because you never know what could be out there. What, what next Einstein, what next great inventor could be you know, sharing their, their talents and gifts with the world if it wasn't for, just like I said, being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah, and I mean, not for nothing, people would probably like to eat tonight, too. <laughs> exactly, yeah, it's hard to invent if you're hungry all the time. It's, it's, Usually, yeah, I've found. Yeah. All right, well, let's continue on here a few more minutes. Let us glance for a moment at the Middle Ages, when great fortunes began to spring up. A feudal baron seizes on a fertile valley. 
but as long as the fertile valley is empty of folk, our baron is not rich. His land brings him in nothing. He might as well possess a property on the moon. What does our baron do to enrich himself? He looks out for peasants. For poor peasants! If every peasant farmer had a piece of land, free from rent and taxes, if he had in addition the tools and the stock necessary for farm labor, who would plow the land of the baron? Everyone would look after his own, but there are thousands of destitute persons ruined by wars, or drought, or pestilence. They have neither horse nor plow. Iron was costly in the Middle Ages, and a drought horse still more so. All these destitute creatures are trying to better their conditions. One day they see on the road at the confines of our baron's estate a notice board, indicating by certain signs adapted to their comprehension that the laborer who is willing to settle on this estate will receive the tools and materials to build his cottage and sow his fields, and a portion of the land rent-free for a certain number of years. The number of years is represented by so many crosses on the signboard, and the peasant understands the meaning of these crosses. So the poor wretches swarm over the baron's lands, making roads, draining marshes, building villages. In nine years he begins to tax them. Five years later he increases the rent. Then he doubles it. The peasant accepts these new conditions because he cannot find better ones elsewhere. And little by little, the aid of laws made by the barons, the poverty of the peasant becomes the source of the landlord's wealth. And it is the lord of the manor who preys upon him. A whole host of usurers swoop down upon the villages, multiplying as the wretchedness of the peasants increases. That is how things went in the Middle Ages. And today, is it not still the same thing? If there were free lands which the peasant could cultivate if he pleased, would he pay fifty pounds to some shabble of a duke, who are condescending to sell him a scrap? Would he burden himself with a lease which absorbed a third of the produce? Would he, on the Mataye system, consent to give half of his harvest to the landowner? But he has nothing. So he will accept any conditions if only he can keep body and soul together. Well, so what this brings up for me is kind of that, that cliche that you'll hear a lot of the, the people that have, have found success in business um, telling people, like, if you don't like your job, just get another one. And that's just such an empty piece of advice because if, it, just as, as Kropotkin was talking about here, what, what really has changed in you know, the, the hundred plus years since this was written. Uh, if you want a new job, it's not just a matter of saying, oh, I just want a different job. Now I'm going to go be, you know, this thing that pays a whole lot more. No, you, you have opportunities available to you based on, on many, many numbers of factors. But for one, just getting a better job, you're still going to be exploited by somebody else unless you're the owner. And then they say, oh, well, why don't you just start your own business? Well, I mean... If we get beyond the, the idea that, you know, it takes a, a, a considerable amount of money and time um, and risk, really, if you don't have anything to, to start a, a business, you're going to be accruing debt for the, the first at least year or so of operation. It's going to take many businesses, take many years to, to finally turn profitable. So, uh, you know, getting beyond the idea of, of even having the right support system in place to, to be able to start a new job. I mean, does, does anyone really think that, that just becoming the exploiter yourself is the answer in all of this? I mean, mathematically, that's impossible. We can't all be business owners under capitalism because we have to have employees to get our profit from. So that at, at some point, you just run out of people to employ. Um, but then also, just it does absolutely nothing to, to change the, the system at all. Like you, you just end up exploiting somebody who's even worse off than you were. How, how noble is that of a goal? I mean, I don't think very much. What are your and I, I would agree. Um, I think that, so two things here. I think one of the, the best ways to discuss with people that, that conversation bit about, you know, oh, you don't like your job, go, go get a different one. Or, you know, it's, it's ugly cousin of, you know, go start your own business. Right. 
there, there's two there's two classes of people in society. You have folks with capital, right? And you have folks who are capital. <laughs> Very um, much. If you have enough money to feed yourself, clothe yourself, get education, get a medical care, you know, own a business, do all those things, and you don't have to work in order to get to that point, right. you have capital. Right. If all of those things, food, a house, clothing, education, medical care, mm-hmm. if all of those are dependent on your ability to get a job, i.e. the only way that you can feed yourself, have shelter, put clothes on your back, is if you're employed by someone, you are capital. Your mm-hmm. labor power is your capital. So as it stands, the class of people who are subjected to the conversation of, oh, you don't like your job, go get a different one. They don't have the means to just do that because in order to do that or to start your own business, you have to have capital. You have to have the means to sacrifice your income for a period of time in order to get a income again. Otherwise, you know, you're just without money, which most people, you know, there's statistics that say 70 percent of Americans today can't afford a four hundred dollar bill without going into debt. And there's another statistic that says something around the same amount, you know, if they go without a job for a month would lose oh, yeah. their, their home or their Absolutely apartment, their got. place yeah. of residency. Mm-hmm. How the hell are we going to look at those people and say, oh, just get a different job? Yeah. Oh, and that, that's very important to keep in mind, too, when when these 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 capitalist um, believers and, and, and boosters say things like, oh, well, I deserve more of the, the profit because I've taken the risk. Well, risk to them is not at all what it is to us. The, the, I, I've heard it said, the worst thing that, that can happen to a capitalist is he becomes a worker. The worst thing that can happen to a worker is he starves on the street, destitute. Those are very different levels of risk. The workers are the ones who are really taking the risk because failure for them is catastrophic. Failure for a business. Well, there's so much government and, and, and legal apparatus that has been arrayed to uh, provide a safety net for the businessman where if they fail, oh, they just they, they press a magic button and it's bankruptcy and then they get all reset to zero. All their debts are gone. They, they have limited liability corporations where, you know, someone comes after them because they, you know, poisoned an entire city or something like that. I mean, within reason. But if they threw just uh, their incompetence, poisoned an entire city's drinking water system or something like that, the most that people could come after them for is for the assets of their business. They're not, they're not even necessarily personally liable for the damage that they cause. Whereas if you were just as a private citizen to go and like dump poison into a, a drinking water system, you'd go to jail and rightly so. <laughs> You've damaged tons of people's lives. It's just right. And that kind of goes into the second thing I wanted to talk about real quick, which is, you know, all of what we've talked about to this point really hammers home this idea of the fact that this is all based off of like social relations Right. in that, you know, the rich can only be rich because there are the poor, but also the poor need the rich in that, like you're talking about these, you know, these peasants who are subjected to these awful existences because the, the only way they can feed themselves is by living on the land of the wealthy. Well, how is that a system that we think is going to be not only talking about like equal, but that's going to progress itself? Because if we know anything about capitalism, if we pay attention to the track it's on in the world that we're in right now, mm-hmm. quality goes down, mm-hmm. cost of production goes up, cost of you know sale goes up and eventually your profits as a business plummet and then you see companies like price chopper and uh, uh tops merging you know who only months ago were two billion dollar companies or million dollar companies but sure. now they're at a point where in order to stay afloat they need to become one subsidiary company you know and mm-hmm. that's that's the path that capitalism goes on because on capitalism stuff, yeah. is not some infinite engine it's it it's a pretends it's that mode of production it has an endpoint right. and the question of our modern time is whether that endpoint is uh, climate catastrophe or mm-hmm. revolution <laughs> very well put yeah because uh, it, it and it might end up being both 
you know. Uh, I hope not. I, really <laughs> I do. hope not either. I would like my kids to grow up on a planet that is still habitable. Very much yeah. so. But yeah, um, before I continue, though, I, um, I've been keeping track of kind of how the, the stream has been going. And I noticed that I'm getting really huge frame drops. We're down to like four frames per second. So I do apologize for that. I'm sure we've been laggy for this whole time. But it just it basically it is what it is. This is about as fast as my my uh, computer can keep up with. And I really wanted to do this this stream with my my guest here. So I'm really hoping that the audio is still coming through. OK, I'm pretty sure that it is. Um, if it's not, just you know, leave a leave a message in the chat, and I'll, I'll see if I can work out it work it out further. But thank you for bearing with us as uh, as I as I test all this stuff out. Um, you know, this is the, the first first time I've had a guest on here, so definitely testing out the capabilities of my computer and and uh, and so forth. So thank you very much for for sticking with us for all this time. Let's continue on. While he tells well and enriches the landlord. So, in the 19th century, just as the Middle Ages, the poverty of the peasant is a source of wealth to the landed proprietor. Part 2 The landlord owes his riches to the poverty of the peasant, and the wealth of the capitalist comes from the same source. Take the case of a citizen of the middle class, who somehow or other finds himself in possession of 20,000 pounds. He could, of course, spend his money at the rate of £2,000 a year, a mere bagatelle in these days of fantastic, senseless luxury. But then he would have nothing left at the end of ten years. So, being a practical person, he prefers to keep his fortune intact, and win for himself a snug little annual income as well. This is very easy in our society for the good reason that the towns and villages swarm with workers who have not the wherewithal to live for a month, or even a fortnight. So our worthy citizen starts a factory. The banks hasten to lend him especially if he has a reputation for business ability. And with this round sum, man the labor of five hundred hands. If all the men and women in the countryside had their daily bread sure, and their daily needs already satisfied, who would work for our capitalist at a wage of half a crown a day, while the commodities one produces in a day sell in the market for a crown or more? Unhappily, we know it all too well. The poor quarters of our towns and the neighboring villages are full of needy wretches, whose children clamor for bread. So, before the factory is well finished, the workers hasten to offer themselves, where a hundred are required, three hundred besiege the doors. But from the time his mill is started, the owner, if he only has average business capacity, will clear forty pounds a year out of each mill hand he employs. He is thus able to lay by a snug little fortune, and if he chooses a lucrative trade and has business talents, he will soon increase his income by doubling the number of men he exploits. And so he becomes a personage of importance. He can afford to give dinners to other personages, to the legal, political dignitaries. With his money, he can marry money. By and by, he may pick and choose places for his children, and later on, perhaps get something good from the government, a con contract for the army or for the police. His gold breeds gold, till at last a war, or even a rumor of a war, or speculation on the stock exchange gives him great opportunity. Nine tenths of the great fortunes in the United States are, as Henry George has shown in this social problems, the result of knavery on a large scale, assisted by the state. In Europe, nine tenths of the fortunes made in our monarchies and republics have the same origin. There are not two ways of becoming a millionaire. This is the secret of wealth. Find the starving and destitute. And make them produce five shillings worth of lucky hit, made with the help of the state. Need we go on to speak of small fortunes attributed by economists to forethought and frugality, when we know that mere saving in itself brings in nothing, so long as the pence saved are not used to exploit the fabishing? 
Take a shoemaker, for instance. Yawn there. <laughs> Grant that his work is well paid, that he has plenty of custom, and that by dint of strict frugality he contrives to lay by from eighteen pence to two shillings a day, perhaps two pounds a month. Grant that our shoemaker is never ill, that he does not half starve himself, in spite of his passion for economy, that he does not marry, or that he has no children, that he does not die of consumption. Suppose anything and everything you please. Well, at the age of fifty he will not have scraped together eight hundred pounds, and he will not have enough to live on during his old age, when he is past work. Assuredly, this is not how great fortunes are made. Suppose our shoemaker, as soon as he is laid by a few pence, thriftily conveys them to the savings bank, and that the savings bank lends them to the capitalist who is just about to employ labor, i.e. to exploit the poor. Then our shoemaker takes an apprentice, the child of some poor wretch, who will think himself lucky in five years' time his son had learned the trade and is able to earn his living. Meanwhile, our shoemaker does not lose by him. and his trade is brisk, he soon takes a second, and then a third apprentice. By and by, he will take two or three working men. Poor wretches, thankful to receive half a crown a day for work that is worth five shillings. And if our shoemaker is in luck, that is to say, if he is keen enough and mean enough, his working men and apprentices will bring him in nearly one pound a day over and above the product of his own toil. He can... I think that's a pretty important point to, to stop at. Um, Marx talks about this a whole lot in the, the labor theory of value, where the owner, um, basically just by owning, doesn't matter if they work or not, are uh, just through their position, take whatever profit they think they can get away with. And you'll see capitalists say, well, uh, you know, labor theory of value is not really great. You're selling your labor and it's for whatever you, know, you think you're worth. And, uh, you know, if, if your potential employer agrees to that, well, then you, you have a contract for your labor and it's everything's fair and on and on and on. Well, isn't it interesting that uh, every time you get a job and the uh, employer is willing to take that uh, amount of, of pay or uh, amount uh, to set aside that amount of pay for you that uh, they don't go broke. They don't actually lose out by, by employing you by that much. And that's because no matter what you're doing, you are producing more for them than you are taking home by a long shot. And even taking out for expenses of, of operation, uh, maintenance and, and future investments, all that stuff, after all of that uh, is, is accounted for, the you are producing a lot more than what you are getting. And that's why I think that the, the labor theory of value, I mean, it just, it, it is describing reality. That is the relationship. The owner takes whatever they feel like, whatever they think they can get away with above and beyond um, what you are making. And in you and your labor are merely just uh, one more business expense. And it's, it's, it's all part of the kind of, uh, the uh, objectification of the worker as just another piece of equipment where the, the owner um, views them the same as they would any sort of machine. Uh, and as, as soon as you get worn out, you just get replaced by another worker. You're just an interchangeable part. And it, it's, it's part of what, what Marx would call the, the alienation of work. Um, uh, you were alienated from the work that you do in that you don't have much of a say in in how that that work is uh compensated and you were alienated in uh, from the your employer in that you are, are basically just one more piece of machinery precisely um and i think yet again this is relationships right because again if your entire income is going towards being able to see tomorrow um, it's very hard for you to start a business, to mm -hmm. become an owner, as they, you know, say, uh, and, um, you know, really meet that level of wealth that it takes to become a member of the ruling class. Because we also have to remember that, you know, if we're talking about some moguls like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, the amount of wealth 
that they have is something that like we don't even understand but to yeah. a point where impossible never once will they struggle and i don't mean like you know we perceive struggle as like damn i, I can't pay a bill they have probably multiple mortgages, multiple LLCs, businesses, mm, subsidiaries, awesome. trading. Co- None of them, even if every single one of their things collapsed, will suffer a day in their lives. Never. Because the amount of wealth that is com- contained in these very few hands is, a, a, I mean, not for nothing, you have to understand that the amount of wealth that Jeff Bezos has is able to employ something like, what, 5 million people in the nation, plus yeah, yeah, I think it's everything yeah. else. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of fucking money. Mm-hmm. And so, we, again, we have to recognize that here a relationship is very important. We can't understand these things independently because rich and poor is not just some term or some label that we throw on people it is a relationship to the other someone is only rich because there are so many poor and someone is only poor because there is someone so rich and Mm -hmm. those both exist because of one another right because of the rich exploiting the poor Mm -hmm. the poor has become poor because the poor has become poorer the rich has become richer and on top of that the poor has you know, double down on their need, their dependence for that rich. And then that rich, you know, that rich, wealthy elite is able to establish entire nations and governments that exist Mm -hmm. solely to maintain their domination over the working class. Yeah. And and once a a wealthy person such as a a Jeff Bezos gets their company to a, a certain size, they basically are in command of an entire country, an entire country's worth of people, an entire con- country's worth of production, worth of GDP, worth of resource consumption. They, they basically could be considered a world power unto themselves, which is asto- astonishing, astounding that, that one person could have so much power in the world where, where they could command more than, than probably many countries could. Um, and why is it that anyone is in charge of these people? This is something that right. you know, I think is in, incredibly important to hit on is if there's, say, five million Amazon employees and there's one, you know, board of directors, one mm-hmm. CEO, you know, because we, we also have to remember there's always going to be the critique of, well, it's not just one of them that's, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. Whatever. It's, it's, it's the system oh, that that person difference. benefits off of, right. and they, you know, serve as a, a you know, a, a servant of the face of whatever oppression looks like. But what sure. I'm trying to say is that, again, the rule of the few over the many. Why mm-hmm. is there so many people that are left absolutely destitute and powerless, while someone like Jeff Bezos is able to amass almost what? 250 300 billion dollars we don't even know it's what that insane. means but that's a, that's uh, right that's almost as many dollars as there is people in the united states I, how about I, that i saw it represented once and they, they had this little square and it represented the entire amount of wealth that uh, your average american worker will see over their entire lifetime it's like you know 1.5 to three million, something like that. And it was this one little square. And then they compared that to like the richest 10% of people. And then they compared it to uh, Jeff Bezos alone. And you would have to keep side scrolling. And you would literally side scroll for minute on minute on minute of these, these towerings, uh, uh, rectangles that were each alone dwarfing the size.